welcome to this uh, session about what to do with long-standing conflicts. What have we learned? What has changed? What are the new trends in conflicts? And what are the new trends in conflict resolution? To do that, we have a great and fascinating way of uh, connecting around the world. Uh, we have, this is part of a very innovative approach from the World Economic Forum. They are connecting 40 cities. Uh, they, in each city, we have the Global Shapers, a new, young, dynamic group of people around the world who are discussing 10 issues that uh, have been identified as the main uh, challenges uh, for the world ahead. And today, we're going to have four of them. Uh, each of them uh, will represent the views they have, have, uh, they have had discussions about these topics. Uh, 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 for, for a while, and we're going to have the benefit of having them with us. Um, we will also have a, a, a distinguished uh, panel. We have all of you, and we have the world uh, through social media. And uh, you can connect with us. You can send uh, uh, your questions, uh, your comments. The hashtag is uh, uh, shaping conflict. And uh, we have uh, a global shaper from South Africa with us, Duncan uh, Luke, uh, who is going to uh, collect uh, your tweets and comments and questions and present it to, to the com in, in, bring them to the conversation. Uh, let me start uh, with the panel. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, uh, and uh, why don't we start to my far right? You asked us to do this very briefly. Juan Carlos Pinzon, Minister of Defense from Colombia. Thank you. I'm Helen Clark, head of the United Nations Development Program, which works a lot on the road from war and conflict back to peace and stability. Jean-Marie Gueno, president of the International Crisis Group, and previously under Secretary for Peacekeeping at the UN, and also chairman of the Mediation Foundation, the Center for Humanitarian, Humanitarian Dialogue. So those of you that want to know more about your uh, panel, you can look at them and you'll discover that we have uh, concentrated in this panel decades of uh, insights, inf experience, uh, and knowledge about conflicts, causes, uh, tragedies, and solutions. Uh, and we have, we're very lucky to have uh, with us from around the world, uh, we have in Gaza, Asma Aboud Mezid. Uh, hello, Asma. Hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. From, uh, from Juba, in Juba, we have uh, uh, Edmund Yakani. Hello, Edmund. Yeah, hi, hello. Yeah, hi, hello. Welcome. From Sri Lanka, Colombo, Mahina Bongso. Hello, Mahina. Hi, everyone. It's nice to uh, get involved in this and meet everyone and hear to what everyone has to say. Thank you. From uh, Salvador, Alejandro Poma. Alejandro, how are you? Hi, Moises. Uh, great to be here. It's 4 a.m. in San Salvador, and we're uh, <laughs> very excited and caffeinated. Apologies for making you uh, wake up this early. <laughs> so uh, all of you have been meeting uh, with uh, other shapers, and we, you have had spirited debates about these issues. Uh, why don't I start with? Um, uh, with Mahina in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Mahina, tell us some of the highlights of your conversations. We're especially interested in learning about new things. What, what is new? Uh, either new ways of approaching conflicts or new ways in which uh, conflicts are manifesting themselves or anything that has changed in the world of conflict. Well, uh, in Sri Lanka, we have just come out of a 30-year-long uh, war. Uh, we actually ended the war in 2009, and there has been peace and development in the country. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on really rebuilding from where we um, stopped. Uh, the war really drained the country of its resources, of its youngsters, and also of uh, much needed time. Now the country is seeing a lot of uh, youth participation, a lot of interest from the youth in living in a better country, in having more tolerance amongst each other, having more em empathy amongst each other. Uh, a very good example of how much the youth has involved in civic uh, participation is when we saw in January uh, the recent presidential election that was held, which was very much youth-led in terms of how the two uh, main uh, presidential election uh, 
uh, candidates really use the youth and used social media to really bring out uh, their messages. So we're really seeing a lot of uh, youth getting involved in um, monitoring whether the government that has been elected uh, has uh, really stuck to its promises, really monitoring uh, their performance and being very critical. Incidentally, there were one million Sri Lankan voters who took part, uh, new voters who took part in the recent election, and those voters were mainly youth. That's very interesting. Jamari Weheno, the International Crisis Group, this, the organization you had, has had a long-standing interest in Sri Lanka and its conflict. Uh, what do you say to what you just heard? Well, I, mean, I think what happened with uh, the elections in Sri Lanka, many people were surprised because they underestimate how society can organize itself. Uh, and when the people, as you just said, are able to connect, then they become aware of their own power. And many situations don't move when that connection doesn't happen, when they, the power of seeing that you are not alone, that there are other people who think like you, and that together you can make a difference. When that happened, that's very powerful. I've seen it in other places. I remember in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where, I mean, change is not happening the way we would like, but the way women have connected throughout Congo has changed the, I mean, the, the role of women in, in the country. Thank you. Um, from, uh, uh, from Gaza, Asma, tell us what, what have been uh, some of your conversations, please. Uh, well, um, what's new in the conflict is that Gaza is entering its eighth year of uh, uh, blockade and it has uh, just survived another aggression in 2014 that lasted for 50 days and resulted in uh, destruction of the infrastructure in the health, in the education, in the private, public and industrial sector. And uh, what's new is that nothing new about the reconstruction process. It still hasn't started and people are still living in shelters, suffering uh, from the weather and the winter and with no potentials of any early starts for the reconstruction. Now, what the youth have done, um, uh, or what's their role in this uh, process, uh, we, uh, in Gaza, we looked at it from different perspective. Uh, we looked at it from political, economic, uh, as well as social uh, perspective. And uh, in the political situation, uh, youth has, uh, doesn't have the ability to be part of the decision making. Uh, but they have done something during the last aggression and they use the social media to raise the awareness about uh, the Palestinian uh, suffering in Gaza and what is actually happening. So what we discuss is that we need uh, leadership that utilize these young people and the talents of the Palestinian people to have more voice. Uh, from the economic perspective, uh, although the youth are recipient of aid and they are the largest recipient, uh, we believe that entrepreneurship could be a way to rebuild and restore confidence and to participate in the economic recovery in, in the Gaza Strip. Thank you very much. It's an interesting and take on a, on a long-standing uh, tragedy. Helen Clark, the UNDP you had, you, you are the leader of the United Nations Development Program. You have a presence uh, there. Tell us uh, both about what you're doing and what are the challenges? What, why, why is it that the United Nations and the donor community uh, is not pr more present? Uh, according to, to what you, we just heard, uh, there are limits to what uh, uh, the, the international community is, is doing there. Well, firstly, I went to Gaza uh, early last year, and I met our staff there and also had a, an incredible meeting with civil society. And what really impressed me from that meeting was just the, the, the not only the resilience of the, of the people I met, but actually the positivity, just like we've heard uh, just now from Asma, looking forward, what could we do? You know, the political situation's pretty stuck, the geopolitics is pretty stuck, but what could we do as, as young people or as women's organisations, uh, human rights organisations, which, which would make a, a difference. So, you know, my heart goes out to those who stay so positive in what seems like overwhelmingly daunting circumstances. What, what do we do? Uh, well, we exist to try and support people to find their pathway to peace, their livelihoods, get the basic infrastructure going. But as Asma's just reminded us, Gaza has just been through a war. A lot of what has been done has been knocked flat again. 
and, and what Gaza overwhelmingly needs is a peace settlement, which is above the pay grade of, of asthma and above the head of the development agency. It needs great powers pushing on all sides to get a settlement which will enable the people of Gaza to live in peace and pursue their development and human potential. Thank you very much, Helen. Let me go to San Salvador. Uh, Alejandro Poma, how, tell us about your conversations, about any insights from your discussions. Well, the, the, the month of January is important for us. Uh, uh, we're a little further removed from, from our civil war than, than, other, than the other colleagues around the table. Uh, this January marked the 23rd anniversary of, of our peace accords. Um, that is something that is always an important symbol for our country. And it reminds us that we are able to achieve things that at one point seemed almost impossible to achieve. So it always provides a sense of uh, hope. It, it reaffirms that we are capable of uh, achieving great things. Uh, but at the same time, we're uh, now in a new stage of our history where we're now confronted with a new cycle of violence. And these are the present challenges we're facing. Uh, unfortunately, we have one of the highest homicide rates in the world. Uh, on average, there's about 12 homicides daily. Uh, in the past month and a half, uh, about 37 policemen have been killed. Uh, and this is, once again, in a, in a scenario where we're not in a civil conflict anymore. But we are now facing, due to gang violence, uh, tremendous difficulties. However, uh, it is the youth of El Salvador which are becoming much more engaged in trying to have solutions to these problems, in promoting dialogue that is constructive, that leads to action, and that will allow us to overcome these problems, just as we did the daunting task of signing a civil war peace accord 23 years ago. Thank you, uh, Alejandro. Uh, Juan Carlos Pinzon, you're the Minister of Defense of Colombia, and there's an opportunity here for uh, helping each other with experiences. Uh, Salvador had a, a very nasty civil war, and they had a peace process that led uh, to the end of that war. Uh, you are now in, engaged in a peace process, you know, in a, in also in a long-standing uh, uh, war with the uh, FARC, uh, and, uh, uh, and there may be lessons there that I'm sure you have already looked at. But at the same time now, El Salvador has a problem with criminality and murder uh, that you had in Colombia in the past, but you were able to solve it. Colombia is one of the success stories of the world in terms of tackling uh, armed violence from, from gangs and, and, and crime, and, and uh, you know, the crime rate, the, the murder rate. So could you please talk about both things, uh, peace processes and negotiating ends to civil war, and at the same time, what, how do you tackle effectively uh, uh, soaring murder rates? Well, I think, as everybody knows, we have been in the middle of a conflict for a very long time. But I would say in the past decade and a half, we have been able to put together a permanent strategy to really move away from conflict. And that has several implications. The first of all was to really strengthen the armed forces because security at the end is critical to really provide services, state services presence. What anyone can't forget is that conflict anyway is related to deeper roots than just violence itself. It's always related to corruption, lack of state, lack of uh, health, lack of, uh, in general terms, presence of the state. Our strategy has been really to cope the national territory and in consequence to, I would say, slower than I wish, but anyway happening, increasing the presence of the state. That has allowed us to really uh, increase every security uh, 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 statistic that you can think. Homicides, just to give you one number for this year, went from 32 per 100,000 to 27.5 per 100,000. So it's a serious reduction for a country like Colombia that 15 years ago was around 60 to 70 uh, homicides per 100,000. So we're moving forward. And I think this environment has created the uh, possibility for the leadership of President Santos and the will of the country to really solve the country, so solve the problem. So this is why we're in the middle of this peace process. 
I think the peace process is advancing. No doubt that we're getting into the important decisions, but anyone can tell that we are closer than ever. I have to tell uh, that on this effort, the, the way the armed forces of Colombia has, have performed has been critical. First, because they got a lot of legitimacy. I mean, uh, the acceptance and the, the way the public refers to the armed forces in Colombia is higher probably than any other place in the world. In essence, because they recover us our security and protect the population as a critical effort. Second, I think, is because uh, they have been engaged in a broader perspective of action. We have been able to engage into interagency effort, and we have been able to put the armed forces to do things that maybe is not their role, but we have been able to use their channel to be able to use them on uh, even public works and these kind of efforts that in very far away areas where nobody else will solve problems has been very useful. I think this is a very important uh, contribution to the peace effort that is happening right now in Colombia. Thank you, Juan Carlos. And let's go from Latin America, from Colombia. Let's go to Sudan. Let's go to Juba. Edmund, how are you? Tell us um, about your conversations. Uh, thank you. Our conversation is more or less in similar context like what my sister have said in Gaza because our situation is exactly like the situation of Gaza where you have peace for a while and the state will go back to violence. So the experience that in our discussions we have come to around is we have experienced issue of displacement of families, division of families, loss of opportunities like job opportunities, reduction in livelihood, people get disconnected, increase in insecurity. Oops. Well, uh, we got uh, disconnected. I'm sure they're already working on it. Uh, Jean-Marie, while we get reconnected, tell us your initial reactions to, to, to what you began, we began to hear. Well, what I find uh, really tragic, actually, in, uh, in South Sudan is that there, is, there has been, to be frank, I think there's been a failure of leadership uh, there, and that uh, if, the, if the leaders of Sudan were doing their job properly, we would not be where we are. There are lots of local conflicts. There is a vibrant uh, civil society that could bring together the great diversity of Sudan, South Sudan, and that is not happening. Good. Let's go back. Uh, you're back. Uh, uh, sorry about that, uh, uh, Edmund. Go ahead. Continue, please. Oh. Yeah, I'm, oh. yeah, I'm back. Um, one thing that also the youth have discussed and have realized among ourselves is that there's this phenomenon of generational clash between the generation which is running the, the state institutions, the state agencies, and the population of the youth, which constitutes 70% of the population. So there's a generational clash which is going on. Another element that also the youth have realized is there's this strategy of where you find politics are militarized, and you find also that uh, politicians try to, to, to link politics and military together. So elements of where you find politics militarized, while military is politicized, and that has brought a lot of frictions that sustainability and issues of uh, stability can't last for long. So I think some of the issues that the youth have brought up. Thank you very much. Let me ask, uh, uh, it, it, and, and Jean-Marie already had alluded to the problem of uh, failure of leadership uh, in, in Sudan and, and the difficulty of uh, having a, a unifying uh, kind of leadership and group. And, and therefore the hope, as you say, Edmund, is that uh, the, from the youth uh, comes uh, the, the opportunity for that. And I want to ask you, Edmund, and all, all of the uh, uh, three global shapers, the notion about the youth being, uh, you know, that age unifies on homogen homogenizes, which is a heroic assumption we, ha we have here, is that all the youth uh, in your countries uh, um, are more or less uh, uh, homogeneous and, and, and share views, and, and that's not true, as we know. So I want to give you a, a chance to each one of you to tell us a little bit about if the the youth are fragmented. What are the, the, the lines in which, within which uh, the, the, the young groups and, and young people are divided? Let, continue, Edmund, uh, with that, please. Yeah, from the perspective of South Sudan in Juba is that the youth are divided to urban youth, which are a bit educated, and you have massive population of the youth in the rural areas, which are 
we're really not educated. So you find among the youth there's a clash between the urban-based youth and the rural-based uh, youth. The urban-based youth are well informed and they have demands, they want to see that rights are respected, while the rural youth are vulnerable that they are being manipulated by politicians. And always they find that they, they do clash with the urban. The urban are pushing for democratic transformation, while the rural, because of their economical vulnerability, they are used by the politicians and they clash with the urban based youth. So I think this is the experience we had in South Sudan. That's why you can hear languages of white army, you can hear militia groups which are really named under a youth movement, so like youth armed group, clashing with the youth in the rural areas, while the urban youth doesn't have such experiences. Interesting. Thank you, Edmund. Asma, what, what about Gaza? Tell us about how the youth in Gaza are divided. What are the lines of division? Well, basically, it's not a question of division among the youth, but it's a, a matter of prioritization. For example, uh, a, a young, uh, young people, when they graduate from the university, they look for jobs. And with this economic and political instability, their main focus is to provide their human needs, the basic human needs. Therefore, there is no space for them to think about development or to think about what we can do in our society because uh, when you lack the basic needs, how can you think of uh, other needs and self-respect and self-actualization? Uh, however, at time of a crisis, like in 2014 uh, during the war, the Palestinian youth showed amazing spirit, whether in helping people who were displaced in shelters, and also in utilizing the social media to raise the awareness. Furthermore, socially, the youth wanted to have an opportunity to express themselves. Therefore, they do initiative that reinforce the human values in the Palestinian society such as mutual respect and cooperation. However, these initiatives are individual and separated because, as I said, it's a matter of prioritization. And when you look at 45% as unemployment rate and high poverty rate, people have different uh, prioritization and needs. Thank you. Thank you. Alejandro in El Salvador. I think there's uh, a few ways that you can segment the way youth are maybe divided uh, across society. W w the clearest one is those that belong to a gang and those that, that don't belong to a gang. Um, somewhere in the middle, there are also what I would consider at-risk youth. So youth that are uh, vulnerable to being attracted to the gang offer. Um, at the same time, I think you have another uh, division going on uh, and that was mentioned in one of our conversations today, and that is that you have a segment of the youth that have access to the market, that have access to the state, that are more, let's say, connected to, to these entities. And then there's another significant part of the youth population that is uh, not as connected and not as included in, in participating in these entities. And so there's a few ways to divide that up, and that I just think adds to the complexity which we're dealing with in trying to solve uh, the problems and attack the issues that are affecting the youth. So it's uh, totally agree with you in, in, in that you cannot throw a, a one blanket over the whole youth population, uh, as, as you cannot just have a cookie-cutter approach to a solution to the problems that the youth are facing. Thank you. And in Sri Lanka? Uh, my Mahina, tell us. Yes, I mean, listening to what Jubas and Salvador and also what Gaza had to say, there was a lot of uh, things that were in common here in Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, the division is mostly due to, as uh, my, my fellow friend from uh, Juba said, it is the divide in the sense of urban and rural uh, youth. The urban youth are more informed, are more able to actively engage uh, than their counterparts in the rural area. For example, the digital divide is a very uh, important uh, thing that we could discuss because uh, social media is playing a huge part, and especially in Sri Lanka, we've seen social media playing a huge part, and that is mostly centered in urban areas and does not have that much of a reach in rural areas. And also the problems of youth are different from uh, which areas they come from. Rural youth have a separate set of problems that make them more vulnerable 
uh, to be fed with certain ideologies, whereas uh, youth in the urban area are more informed and they are not as susceptible to these ideologies. But however, I would also like to stress that um, after, after a certain time, after a 30-year-old war has ended in Sri Lanka, there's one thing that all youth have in common, and that is not to really uh, suffer from such a catastrophe again, because most of the youth aged from between 15 to 29 were born into the war. They have been war babies. They have not known anything else other than war. So now, uh, when there is a change from war to peace, we also see a change in youth from being, uh, being restricted to being more liberal. So right now, um, the divide is trying to be bridged through various exchange programs here in Sri Lanka, where youth from different ethnicities are encouraged to really um, mingle with each other through various uh, projects and various programs that are being uh, initiated. And one thing that is really uh, a binding glue amongst everybody is the culture and how culture can play a huge part in bridging this divide between youth from all areas of Sri Lanka. Thank you, Mahina Boxo, Bongso from Colombo. Let me bring from South Africa, Duncan Luke, who's not in South Africa, he's here, and he's been collecting uh, the comments uh, that are coming from social media. Uh, Luke, tell us, what are, what are people saying, asking? Sorry, at the moment I say the hashtag shaping conflict Please get involved in the audience as well. We want to hear your views. Use the hashtag. We want to get more opinions. I think a lot of conversations come from the stage. We need more from social media. Please. Thank you. OK, good. So let's hear from the panel. What are some of your reactions, for example, about the way in which the youth can be mobilized, energized, and become uh, uh, more of a player, at the same time recognizing that the youth is a wide category that has uh, uh, different segments? Uh, let me start from uh, Juan Carlos and then walk my way through back. Well, let me comment a little bit on, on, on some of the things I just hear. One, no doubt that, I mean, even if you solve conflict, as it appears it has happened in at least three of the cases, uh, there is always the risk of coming back to certain kind of violence and certain kind of uh, new kind of conflict, not necessarily represented by the same actors, but anyway, just representing violence uh, among the people. I think that tackling the issue of the youth is critical. One of my own personal experiences uh, moving along my country from place to place is really to see and guarantee, and that's a challenge we have, that these youth people that is coming out, in the future they will not be recruited by uh, terrorist groups or armed groups, but they will be recruited by gangs if we don't do some kind of effort to guarantee education and jobs. And that's critical, you know. We have to see this uh, uh, conflict resolution environment beyond just uh, the effort of ceasing uh, violence uh, in a stage. And a central point there to keep in mind is that we are all for the youth engagement and uh, participation, but let's also recall that the youth can also engage in uh, armed conflict and become terrorists uh, and become very violent. And I, I think it's very important to keep in mind that when we're talking about youth engagement, we're also talking about youth engaged uh, in very nasty uh, uh, conflicts. Helen. Yeah, well, the key thing is to provide the ways for the youth to engage positively because where you have exclusion and marginalization and the only money that's going around is from gangs to get you to do bad things, well, that is an option, sadly, people uh, will go for. So there's also a socioeconomic side to this that youth need opportunity, they need skills, they need education, they need livelihoods, they, they, they need a basis for, for, for a dignified uh, life. But I want to come back to a couple of other issues that have been raised. Firstly, on leadership, absolutely critical, and often not in great supply. But if we take Colombia, I am a huge admirer of what President Santos has achieved. Don't think it was easy to launch a peace process in, in Colombia, and a peace process without a ceasefire, and soldiers kept getting killed, police kept getting killed, but he stuck with it. 
he persuaded the voters to give him a second term. And I think we're that close now to a settlement. But as the defence minister said, in a way then the hard work begins to overcome the, the, the legacy of all this and not to see an ongoing high level of violence and citizen insecurity as uh, El Salvador has, has, has seen, as has been explained uh, this morning. So I think um, you know, a, a peace settlement's one thing, and often they're not sticking. We're seeing that in South Sudan. We see settlements reached, and then they disintegrate, and, and so on. So in, in driving forward, I think we have to recognize that there's much deeper issues around building cohesion, building dialogue, bringing the youth in, bringing the women in, building the institutions that will encourage interaction between people. It's almost a bottom-up uh, process of building peace, not a top-down one that says, oh, the leaders have agreed, and then they go away and, and disagree. We've got to engage whole societies in this. And my last point is how powerful social media can be in this. Social media is a mobilizing tool. It's an interacting uh, tool. I recall from uh, earlier times of the upheaval in, in Egypt, uh, one of the activists saying, you know, we use Facebook to get the crowd to the rally. We tweet from the rally and then we put the videos on, on, on YouTube. Uh, it, they're very, very insightful as to how these media can be used. Obviously, not everyone has equal access to these, the, these media. But I think as, as a democratising and engaging force, it can be tremendously useful and can be used for peace. Thank you, Jean-Marie. Well, when you were asking the question, I was reminded of my first experience as a peacekeeper. I was in a camp in Sierra Leone in uh, 2000, and I had to speak to about 100 youth who were not like the four uh, friends we have on the screen. They were former combatants who had committed atrocities. Who had, their youth had been stolen by, by, by war. And I had to, to, to talk to them. And what, what struck me really, and this, uh, it reflects also the divide between rural and urban youth. These youth, they had been manipulated uh, and they had committed atrocities in some ways because they thought that was a way to ensure their security. And so I think what's so important for the youth uh, in, in, in countries emerging from, from, from conflict is that ensuring their security is not taking a gun to go shoot uh, the people who feel they thre threaten them, but rather to organize themselves in very local community-based structures uh, so that there is a feeling of security, because that's the first good. They want jobs, but the first job they are offered is a gun to shoot, and they have no other expertise, so to speak, than to shoot. And they have to be helped in what they really want, which is not to shoot, which is to have a life, to have a decent life. And for that, I think local experience, and there has been some, for instance, in Haiti, with, uh, with gangs in Haiti, where traditional disarmament, as the United Nations uh, does it, didn't really work, because they're not, uh, they, they were urban uh, gangs uh, there. And so you had to work at a very local community level. There have been some uh, Brazilian uh, NGOs that have done wonderful work in, uh, in Haiti, uh, precisely keeping those, the, those young people in the neighborhood where they were, but making them discover that there was another way to run that neighborhood than protection and racket. Such an important point. Well, we have heard some very interesting points. Let's hear from the audience here. Is there anyone here that has a question, a comment? Just raise your hands. Oh, here we, we have. Just tell us who you are and briefly. I'm Caroline Spellman. I'm a British politician, uh, formerly Environment Secretary. Uh, does the panel think that one of the benefits of social media, it, it allows um, society to express its desire for peace? One of the difficulties is often leaders want war, but uh, the silent majority don't get a, an easy way to show how much they really don't want that, especially women. Thank you. And why don't I let uh, our uh, global shapers, uh, uh, one of them, who wants to, to answer that question? Uh, Colombo, Gaza, Juba, San Salvador, raise your hand if you want to answer about the role of social media in uh, channeling the real wishes of the majority. Edmund, go ahead. Yeah, I think social media play a big role in terms of 
spreading information, spreading opinion, and, and mobilizing also opinions and mobilizing decisions. I'll give an example recently when we have our crisis in South Sudan in mid-December. We have really social media play a bigger role in informing people actually what's the crisis. If you hear, there's a much more message getting out there. It is an ethnic clashes. But what we know as South Sudanese within South Sudan, the real problem, it is an internal competition within the ruling party between the two top leaders. And the social media which proved that. And even some of the politicians, some of the ruling members in the party also start joining the social media and start uploading actual information that look here, these are areas where we disagree on. And that has diffused the rate of the violence is spreading all across the country. And I think really I do agree. Social media play a bigger role and we can use social media for peace and we can use social media to cut down engagement of youth in bad issues because my concern is that if we can open up social media in such a way that youth can have access to social media. For example, as my sister in, um, have mentioned that the rural, the rural areas may not have access to social media like the urban youth. But the initiatives now we're picking up is, can we create stations of social media? Can we create institutions that promote social media in the rural areas so that the dialogue between the urban and the rural can continue? So that's what I would like to say, that social media will play a bigger role. Interesting. Asma, I saw that you also wanted to say something. Asma, I saw that you yes. also wanted to say something. Uh, although, uh, uh, as you said, the social media are very important, but they are only one factor that affects the desire of people and the status of things. For example, Palestinians through social media and all type of media have been uh, uh, demanding the lifting of the blockade for eight years so far, but nothing has changed. Uh, also during the last aggression uh, on, pa on Gaza in 2004, they also has been uh, demanding the, the stop of the war and the lifting of the siege and the end of the occupation but also nothing has happened uh, so far. So it's not only about using social media alone, it's about having the whole community, whether it's local community or international community, to stand as well and to do action rather than just demanding things. We need uh, things on action. Uh, and in and, and Gaza, there, has been a, there is a long way to go towards lifting the siege and the, re, the start of the uh, reconstruction process as well. Thank you, Asma. And again, from the audience, any, any questions? Over there, please. Tell us who you are, please. Good, good morning. Yeah, sorry. Good morning. My name is Francis Malij. I work at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and I'm based in Ukraine, which is uh, one of the areas where conflict resolution would be needed one of these days. Uh, I had a question, actually, as to the interaction between the grassroots, uh, that's admirable and we see from the screen and we heard about, and the leadership role in resolving the conflict. Um, so how does this play out? What triggers the other? Do we need one before the other? How does this play out? Great question. Thank you. The panel. Well, l l let me comment a little bit on, on practical tools that we have been able to develop in order to confront the realities we, we, we found in the field. I think one very important uh, tool has been uh, creating a policy of interagency work. Uh, that that sounds very uh, obvious and kind of very uh, natural uh, is not so easy to happen. Uh, it really started to happen in our case just five uh, years ago in which we really were able to bring in other agencies of the state where the security forces were already present and being in the, in the ground. I think that's critical, having that kind of uh, efforts. Second, a permanent uh, individual humanitarian demobilization program. There is always the possibility that particularly young people can suddenly decide that they are in the wrong way or that they feel too, mu too many pressure. Whatever the case, nothing is better in a conflict than saving lives. And the demobilization program allows you to uh, create a permanent, somehow uh, commercials and some others will say propaganda, but at the end what you're trying to do is getting young people or whomever wants uh, to, to get out of the, of the conflict of the violence. That will be the second part. Third, we make a decision to integrate into our military capabilities the police efforts. That as well sounds very obvious, but it's quite difficult to happen. When you get that, you're really getting a very effective tool because 
in this kind of conflict, if you go just for the military solution, suddenly you will find fighting the military among the people. And that's a risky business. It creates the risk for human rights issues and other uh, serious problems. But if you have the military uh, working together with the police and police units really uh, judicializing all these crimes that happen around conflict that are at the end the source of funding for violence, you can really go after uh, bad guys. The mining will be another uh, very important feature to have uh, among you know, other tools that we have been developing. I will end by saying conflict resolution at the end requires leadership, as you said, uh, decision in order to know when to go uh, and end, but at the end all the time, a very innovative attitude, a very innovative attitude. Innovation in conflict is vital because uh, whomever is in crime, whomever is uh, fighting, is always responding faster than states can. And here's where you have to be innovative, both providing social, economic policies to solve problems fast, but at the same time, allowing your uh, security services to provide security. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm interested in the question about that interaction between leadership and grassroots, and where's the main push for peace coming? And I guess in my observation, there's not so many leaders like President Santos who stand out front and say, follow me, you know, follow me on a path to peace and I'll start addressing some of the basic issues around the land rights, the poverty, the marginalisation, the, the exclusion, uh, and so on. So where you don't have a... And a leader like that needs the grassroots also to come on board because you can get quite lonely as a leader standing out front of, if people aren't coming behind. I've been a Prime Minister, I know what that feels like. Uh, fortunately, not, not in these kind of extreme situations. But where that sort of leadership isn't there, uh, then I think the role of, of the grassroots in, in pushing the leaders to do what needs to be done is extremely important. I just wanted to give one example. It's not necessarily related to a conflict, but it's one where things could have gone off, off, off the rails. Uh, the last election in Senegal looked like being quite a messy one. It was tough fought. And uh, what made a big difference there was the women got mobilised. They said, we want Senegal to continue as a peaceful country which transfers power constitutionally and peacefully and results are accepted. They reached out to the youth. They started the peace caravans going through the, the, the country to urge for peace and calm between different groups of supporters and, and, and peoples. They approached the leaders. And, and what was the outcome? It was successful. The leader said, yeah, we've got to behave in a certain way. We're not going to, you know sort of rack up these mobs that are going to uh, attack each other, and it worked out okay. That was a great example of, of leadership from the grassroots, and there are a lot of such examples. It is a good example. Jean-Marie. I want to say a word on the uh, leadership uh, grassroots connection, but also follow up on what Asma uh, said. On the leadership grassroots connection, I think a lot has to do with the design of peace negotiations. Uh, more often than not, of course, the negotiation has to be first with those who have the guns, because if the, those who have the guns are not in the negotiation, you're not going to go very far. But at the same time, you have to provide a forum for, for those who have no guns to be part of the process. And there are some negotiations where that has been done, and some where that has been ignored, and then you don't have a, a, a real good result because those who are the future of the country have been ignored. But on the question of uh, asthma and social, me and, and social media, I think this is a really fundamental issue because social media, they are a multiplier. They help build communities, but they can be very closed communities within a particular country where social media can mean that uh, you, you talk to the people who think like you instead of building a, a, a broader platform. And so the social media, they can bring a country together. They can also t tear it apart. And then the other thing, and I think that's what uh, Asma was alluding to, the conversation in a country it may be very different from the global conversation. And what we need is really, I mean, for instance, in Gaza is a case in point. The way the people in Gaza experience the life in Gaza, who understands it outside Gaza? Who understands it in the United States? Uh, who understands it in Europe? Uh, the, you can have a, a hashtag, but the, the, who... Will, will it be a hashtag that will be followed in the same proportions by the people in Gaza and the people in New York or Paris or London? And that's what we need to work hard to change. Let me just jump a little bit that's on That's a great point. Briefly. <laughs> Very briefly. 
uh, problems are local. And I think your, your vision on that is very, very right. Uh, even in a country like mine, when, when we go and try to solve problems, uh, depending on where you are, you know, the approach has to be real yeah. different. So let me provoke you and our sh global shapers and the audience into a very thorny problem, which is about leadership. It has been mentioned that leadership is a requirement, that failures of leadership explain a lot of these tragedies, the difficulties of finding leaders. So leadership is easy to diagnose and easy to prescribe, but it's very paralyzing. It's a very paralyzing prescription. If you go to a country that is suffering from a massive societal challenge and you say, well, you need leadership. Well, you know, thank you very much, you know. <laughs> and so and when I, I have to confess, and I think I capture the mood of the, of the room, when we hear the, these four individuals from around the world, uh, I want them to be leaders. I, I, want, I, I am more enthusiastic about them, and I want them to in, in charge, uh, rather than some of the leaders in their respective countries. How do we then solve the conundrum of getting leadership when there's any? What, what, how, how do we stop from prescribing something that is so obvious, but yet so hard to get? Let me ask, I don't know who to ask, everyone. Uh, uh, let me ask uh, Alejandro Poma, who has, hasn't said anything for a while. Alejandro, what do you think? I, I heard you a little bit uh, uh, interrupted, uh, so I, I, I didn't get the, the whole gist of, of the message, uh, but I'll, I'll try to answer from what I got. Um, leadership, it, there's not, you know, there's not, uh, us, uh, and we were, we talked about this today in one of our in one of our conversations in, in the hub. Um, there's not a messianic soup, you know superman or woman that's going to pop up and uh, you know miraculously solve uh, solve our society's problems. Um, it, it's more about creating a critical mass of engaged people that are willing to to act. Uh, you know, dialogue is a necessary first step. It's required to establish a shared vision and to set up some, you know, uh, bold goals to reach. But ultimately, it requires a group of people uh, working towards those goals, uh, motivated and inspired and, uh, and, and relentless and resilient. Um, but but it's, it's, always, it's always a group that allows, you know, things to be accomplished. It's rare that uh, you know a, a, a solitary individual comes along and, and does it on his own. And I think that what we have here today uh, in San Salvador is a group of you know 30, 40 amazing young leaders that are engaging, that are acting, that are taking constructive action to deliver tangible results. Because ultimately, the only way to to, to progress and move forward is to have tangible outcomes, positive outcomes that affect people's lives in a good way. And if that's not, you know, if that's not happening, then people get frustrated. Uh, then, you know, uh, protagonists on the stage lose credibility. Um, and it's actually, you know, uh, it could erode uh, whatever uh, good things a dialogue can provide if there's no action that produce uh, tangible, you know, measurable uh, results in the improvement of individuals' lives, it becomes very difficult uh, to sustain uh, credibility and sustain trust in, in, in the ability of society to move ahead. Thank you, Alejandro. The audience, any comments, questions, please go ahead. My name is Marie-Christine Joria, and uh, I'm following what's happening in Gaza quite a lot, and I visited Ramallah in order to see myself how, how things are actually there. And I have a question to Helen and also to Asma. Because leadership is, is a two-sided sword. Because if you are a leader and uh, you are gathering a crowd, a crowd behind you, and all of us who are in business, we know that, you also need to show to the crowd that you have the right vision and that you are able to help the crowd to guide them into the right direction and to have success. Otherwise, you lose their follow, um, you lose them. So, I mean, if you are such a leader and you're sitting there in the biggest prison and you see that the Western world is not giving you the necessary support and is constantly rowing back, 
So how can you be a leader? So what I would like to know is what do you need? What can we do? What can we as individuals here do to help you to be a successful leader? Thank you. Asma, that was for you. Uh, well, um, leadership, as you said, it's very important. Uh, and leaders and the Palestinian society and population is a very young society. So these people, if they got the right education and the awareness and the opportunity, they will be leading tomorrow and they will be leading the change to have uh, a better um, opportunities for Gaza and better society. Now, regarding what, what individuals can do, well, it's not, uh, one hand cannot clap, so you need a collective uh, effort. So, yes, individuals can support uh, Gazans through their um, solidarity and support from all over the world, but this is not enough. Uh, here in Gaza, we are, due to the blockade, we are disconnected physically, and due to the electricity cut, we are disconnected virtually as well. So. Um, what is best to ensure leadership uh, for Palestinian young people is that to break this um, blockade and to break the distances that is keeping us away from the whole world, visit, like having exchange programs and lifting the siege and uh, exchanging experiences could be a very tool to empower young Palestinians in Gaza. Not only that, but having a proper education and awareness about what, how we can deal with this conflict and how we can move forward from whatever we are experiencing is a very powerful uh, tool for the whole world to do in Gaza. Thank you very much, Asma. Any other questions, comments? So a lot of these conflicts, of course, generate a lot of distrust. And so one initial step uh, to, to solve conflicts is to create uh, trust-building measures. Um, what are any of the new developments of the new ideas in which one can engage new tools and new groups of society and new forms of organizing to build trust uh, in societies that have been, uh, where mistrust uh, is, is, is the, the, the central dominant feeling among uh, groups in conflict? Well, I think coming out of any kind of conflict or trauma, the first thing that people want is to be heard. There's got to be a truth telling. There's got to be a, an ability to, to, and a capacity and a space to tell one's, one's story. Uh, and we've seen this uh, in the way South Africa came out of a traumatic period of, of history, the apartheid period, the role that truth and reconciliation played. You know, my, my own country, New Zealand, is still, in effect, running a long-term truth and reconciliation and uh, a reparations process for wrongs of colonisation in the 19th century. So these issues aren't necessarily quickly solved, but the process, the truth-telling of what happened and, the, and the, the coming together to talk about that and then to find a way forward is, is extremely important. So I think uh, when societies who are in a transition from something very bad to, of course, to something better... Uh, it, the, these processes, the building institutions, the consultation, the being inclusive as you can, uh, this is extremely important. And if we look at uh, one of the, the countries uh, which has experienced the uprisings in the Arab states, uh, perhaps the one that, that has come through in the most interesting way is Tunisia, which had a very inclusive process to reach out around a new constitution, new social contract, new settlement, uh, and I think that's well worthy of study. Thank you. Uh, Duncan, uh, any news from social media? Yes, I think the consensus is what can we do? So there's a lot of questions about us and what can we do? So I'm just going to read out one or two that I've picked up. The first one from Carla is how can academia contribute in keeping a balanced view of post-conflicts? There's another overlapping one. I just want to add to that. Must the, from Cristina Lopez. Must the solutions of conflict come from the people or from their governments? Thank you. So the question I think implicit is how can one bring new actors and new players that are independent, objective, and helpful in creating trust, in creating dialogue, in, in building bridges, in finding ways for groups in conflict to, to start talking and start uh, uh, reaching uh, 
ways of working together, Jean-Marie? Well, I think it starts with having a narrative that is not completely incompatible between the various actors of a conflict. And so, for instance, uh, at uh, Crisis Group, our analysts, they shuttle between the various actors, telling them, oh, we were told that. Oh, no, it's not at all what, what the reality is. And then gradually you come to the reality. If you don't have that kind of agreement, if you don't, know what the fa if you don't agree on the facts, you are unlikely to agree on the solutions. I mean, if I think of my own country, uh, France, and the, the reconciliation with Germany after World War II, this was a, a long effort which involved acknowledging what had happened. Uh, that's very important uh, for a sound foundation uh, for peace. And I think the same, it's the same thing for in, internal conflicts, for civil wars. Um, it's, it doesn't ca come quickly because, of course, I mean, many people have died. There have been a lot of passion. You have to understand the narrative of your enemy. You have to understand his fears. I mean, most conflicts are born out of mutual fears. But I think this effort at truth and reconciliation, as Ellen said, but also historical truth, and when the, the question of academia, I think the more you can have an objective reading of what, has, what is happening, what, uh, the more you can have histories that are not geared to, to create one narrow perspective, I think the better the chance for uh, peace. Very good. Thank you. Any other question from the audience? Yes, please. Um, I, I have a sense of s some kind of naivete in some of this discussion, so I want to ask uh, perhaps a provocative question. Uh, in each of these, many of these conflicts, there are spoilers. 90% of the people will sort of agree on what a reasonable solution is, mm -hmm. but there are those who actually have incentives to perpetuate the conflicts and they gain by keeping these conflicts alive. Uh, that is my perception, for instance, uh, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I think the bulk of the people sort of know where the solution lies, but somehow we can't get there because of the spoilers. So my question is, how do you deal with those who have an incentive to perpetuate these conflicts? That's a, a great question, and I'm going to use that question to ask uh, uh, each one uh, of you uh, final reflections about what we have heard about the conversation, and especially about the notion that we are discussing conflicts uh, like uh, without taking sufficiently into consideration uh, the incentives of some spoilers that have... Uh, you know, reasons and, and, again, incentives to keep the conflict going. So why don't I start with the four shapers around the world, give you a very brief one to two minutes maximum uh, opportunity to give us some reflection on what you have heard, and also, if you can, please address the very good question about uh, how to deal with those that don't want the conflict to end. Let me start uh, in reverse order from uh, what I did at the beginning. So I think I'd, uh, I, I'll start with Edmund in, in Juba. Yeah, thank you. I think, as a summary of my conclusion, is that the discussions have shown very clear that though we need leadership, but also we need credible state institutions that can meet the expectations of the citizens, can meet the expectations of the success, because in South Sudan, as much you talk of leadership, but we don't have those institutions, so this is summary. In regard to the spoilers, I think if we can set a priority to ensure that justice and accountability follow perpetrators of violence, I think that really can help us with the spoilers, because most of the spoilers are will engage in committing human rights atrocities. At the same time, also, there are some spoilers who are not within the countries. There are some spoilers who are outside for economical gains that the flow of arms to the hands of civilians to maintain violence, to create market for the arms. So if we can hold justice and accountability as a priority to deal with the spoilers, we'll be much more better. And this the situation we are experiencing in South Sudan. Also, we have a spoilers who doesn't want to see stability exist. They really benefit from having a continuous violence among the communities and among the citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Edmund Yakani, the director of CEPO in South, uh, uh, in Juba, South Sudan. Thank you very much. Uh, Alejandro Poma in El Salvador, San Salvador. Please go ahead. Yes, I think we have um, 
you know, we're a little bit further removed from, from our civil war. Signing the peace does not guarantee that there won't occur violence if the root causes of these situations are not attacked. And those root causes are multidimensional. They're economic, they're social, uh, cultural in many respects. So, you know, we continue to, uh, to work on the root causes uh, to try to progress and move forward. Uh, another, another area that's very important that the hub is very uh, focused on is creating spaces for dialogue, for dialogue that will be constructive and action-oriented. Uh, that was a root cause of the, of the war initially, and there were limited spaces where for expression and communication and for the participation on a more massive uh, basis uh, of the community in, in solving the country's problems and having political representation. So uh, that is one project that is actively being worked on right now that is already producing tangible results, and uh, it's, we're very excited about that. But and, uh, continue to work on the root causes is a commitment that we have going forward, and hopefully that will allow us to, to bring great results to the complex situation we're dealing now with gang violence. Thank you very much. Alejandro Poma is the managing director of Grupo Poma in uh, El Salvador, San Salvador, and he woke up at 4 a.m. this morning to be with us. So you can go get a nap once we're done. Thank you very much, uh, Alejandro. Uh, Asma Abu Mezid in Gaza, please tell us your final reflections. Well, um, in, in Gaza and in Palestine in general, uh, the situation is uh, very complicated and uh, not only locally but also on the global level because there are different factors and different parties that can influence the political situation in, in Gaza. And as uh, San Salvador said that we need to tackle the grassroots. So talking about Gaza, we need the first thing to do is to lift the siege because you cannot talk about progress and dialogue once people are only looking for their basic needs. So this is where it could start to enable a better future, is that to end this siege and to end the occupation. Uh, regarding uh, the spoiler, as I said, uh, the, uh, uh, not only the political situation, there are different factors, but also in the economic level. We have in Gaza different international organizations which come from different uh, countries, and uh, unfortunately, their efforts is not coordination, uh, coordinated. So having a coordination between all these efforts can also result in economic recovery and sustainability. Thus, youth will have more opportunity to think about their welfare and to think about participation in the decision making, politically, economically, and also, also socially. Thank you, Asma. Asma Abu Mezid. She's a researcher and a, a member of the Global Shapers. Thank you very much. And then uh, Mahina Bongso in uh, Colombo, Colombo, Sri Lanka. Go ahead. Well, uh, in a conflict situation, if you look at it, um, the leadership and even those parties involved in the conflict, the first uh, set of people they really go to in times of conflict are the youth. The youth are the first people they go to because the youth are the ones who need to be armed to engage in conflict. At the same time, it is important for the leadership and all parties involved to understand following a conflict at a time of peace just as much attention you pay to youth during conflict, you must pay to youth after conflict. That is by encouraging them to educate them, to have them actively involved in the rebuilding of a nation. And that comes with really creating trust amongst youth and the rehabilitation of youth. For instance, uh, in Sri Lanka, We've seen the ex-terrorist uh, combatants being rehabilitated, going through a program of rehabilitation, uh, and also giving jobs. But these uh, programs, these policies need to be more streamlined, more transparent, where not just youth of one area or one sector, but youth um, as, o as an overall community are given the equal opportunities, such as education, better health care, uh, more participation in civil society. So as to not allow uh, conflicts to arise once again in the future. 
and also talking about spoilers. Yes, there are always certain groups within society who don't want a conflict to end. And even after a conflict ends, they would always try to create certain um, uprisings that would lead to a conflict. For example, in Sri Lanka, we have seen certain groups, certain extremist groups trying to really uh, uh, say out the extremist views and try to engage people in another unrest, in another ethnocentric separatist movement. But it is, if the communities can all mobilize together and say no, it will not go forward. And also, it's a lot of attention that the, that the leadership has to play, has to um, really show. For instance, during a conflict, there is so much of expenditure that is uh, put for state and defense, and education, healthcare, all of that is just secondary. So post-conflict, it is very important that allocations, funds are directed towards education, healthcare, and also engage youth and other um, interested individuals in the policy making process. Like for instance, during our panel discussion, a very important uh, recommendation was made, and that was to have um, a youth engagement in independent commissions, uh, and also have youth being mentored by politicians, so that the youth will be able to engage more in politics and in the decision making process, and also be sort of a mediator between the other youth groups out there. So uh, overall, there's a lot of uh, change that is happening. And after a conflict, it is the youth who can be the vanguard of that change, who can be active agents of uh, peace. It all depends on whether they have been given the correct facilities, the correct know-how to engage in not letting conflicts uh, happen again. Thank you very much, Mahina. She's a news anchor with MP MTV, NBC Networks in Colombo, Sri Lanka. Thank you. The panel, your final reflections. Uh, let's start with you and then walk our way back here. Final refle reflections. Uh, first, re remember all that violence and conflict is uh, related to many causes. You know, it can be related to crime, it can be related to corruption, it can be related to really social needs and real uh, problems. So you cannot just tackle uh, the issue of conflict with one single tool, either you know fighting crime or defeating uh, insurgents, or just thinking that by taking social policies you will solve it all. You need to put the two things together, uh, work in a very uh, holistic and interagency effort, and try to uh, you know provide the solutions place by place. Second, I think security is critical. People, in order to uh, regain trust from state, from government, requires to feel secure and protected by uh, security institutions. So that's very important. The legitimacy of those institutions, the way they perform uh, related to the community. And by the way, uh, that will allow other agencies, other even private sector NGOs to really come and find the environment to really uh, and the real roots and causes of, of, of conflict. Thirdly, in the Colombian case, and I mean, history hasn't been written yet. We're working towards that. And we hope that uh, sooner than later, we will really can uh, call peace in Colombia. But I think those that can be called the architects of peace in Colombia will be the armed forces. They have been leading all this effort and they have to lead the sustainability of peace effort uh, in the future. And I think that's uh, quite interesting and uh, probably in panels in the future about this, we might see how uh, it came, it happened, and how we should uh, keep working to, to really sustain peace that has been a real challenge in Colombia. Thank you, Minister Pinson, and we wish you good luck. Um, you. Ellen. Well, on the issue of spoilers, they're a fact of life. They're to be found in any society, whether it's one trying to recover from trauma or, or one that's uh, allegedly at peace. Uh, there's always people who are destructive rather than constructive. And in essence, you have to drain the swamp of their support uh, by building an overwhelming dynamic for something, something better for the society. And that's where I think it, it's important that we broaden the concept of leadership, because leadership isn't just about heads of government or political parties or, or those sort of commanding heights. Leadership is 
within each one of us. It's in civil society. It's, it's in the way uh, we organize at the local and, and community level. So if, if the so-called leaders and the geopolitics are slow, create a, a dynamic from the bottom up. Use the leadership uh, power that, that you have in communities. There's one more concept I wanted to put on the table, and that is the, the very important role of what some of the trade now call the inside mediator. I'd call the honest broker. You know, who, who for me are the real heroes in Central African Republic at the moment? That uh, archbishop and the, and the most senior imam, the people who, despite chaos and mayhem, go out and try to say to their respective communities, we've got to find a better way. We've got, we've got to live uh, together. Uh, I think of the, the role played by the, the major union confederation in Tunisia, which was able to speak to all sides and be a mediating force. I think of the, of the role of the, the, the local mayor in building tolerance between uh, communities, the, lo the local chiefs, the local peace architecture. So I think focusing more on this role of the inside media, to the forces within the community, which are committed to a peaceful outcome and something better. Thank you very much, Ellen. And Jean-Marie. Well, the first thing I would want to say is that the youth has to organize itself before a conflict erupts, because it's much harder to end a conflict than to prevent it. Uh, but once a conflict has erupted, I think the, the longer it lasts, the more difficult, actually, it is to end, because it fragments. And I would want to answer the, the questions on spoilers, because as a conflict lasts, uh, there's a war economy that develops. And there are many uh, people, constituencies, that have an interest in keeping the conflict alive. It's naive to think that everybody wants uh, peace. I, I totally agree with uh, so that sad obs uh, observation. And so the real challenge for all of us is how you build a critical mass of people who are sufficiently well organized to see the benefits of moving out of a war economy. Because more and more as conflict uh, last, the distinction between political agendas, criminal agendas, becomes blurred. Uh, it, the conflict becomes more fragmented and also more fluid. And so making people agree on a political platform of peace is hard. And so what is needed then is for the civic organization, for the youth, but not just the youth, for all the civil society that can organize itself to develop uh, that platform so, that, so as to make visible the benefits of uh, a peaceful uh, solution. But I have seen in many situations how the critical group of those who would lose from peace uh, sometimes have the dominant narrative, and that narrative has to be fought. Juan Carlos Pinzon, Minister of National Defense of Colombia. Helen Clark is the administrator, the leader of uh, the United Nations Development Program. Jean-Marie Gehenno is the CEO, President and CEO of the International Crisis Group. Our shapers from around the world, Colombo, Gaza, Juba, San Salvador, and you all have uh, created a very interesting conversation that is uh, both uh, uh, troubling and uh, hopeful. Uh, we continue to focus on these long-standing tragedies, but at the same time, we see how there are new ways of tackling them that provide hope. And one, I think, of the main hopes is having people like those in our screens around the world that are thinking in different ways of tackling uh, this problem. So thank you very much, and please join me uh, in thanking um, our panels and our members. Here.